Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to the launch party for Ron Blumenfeld's uh, historical mystery novel, The King's Anatomist. Uh, I'm so glad that you could join us and be a part of this event, and uh, we're going to have a great time. Just a couple things to get us started. Um, the chat feature is on your lower right. Feel free to communicate with others uh, on the chat. Say hello. Let us know where you're coming from. Let us know what a great uh, novel it was if you read it, or uh, maybe if you plan on reading it, let us know what you're planning on reading it. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see we have a poll. This is a simple poll that just interested to know uh, if you have met the author, if you know Ron, or uh, and also if you have read the novel or not. Also, there's an ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen. Anytime throughout the event, you can post a question for the author. And you can also vote for the ones that you like most. So if we have, say, 10 questions in there, the ones with the most votes will show up highest on that list of questions. So go ahead and, and post a question anytime during the event, and then we will be able to ask those questions of author Ron Blumenfeld. My name is Colin Muskell. I am the founder and editor of 53 Fiction, an independent press uh, publishing historical fiction novels that are both uh, compelling fictional stories, but also uh, educational um, stories about real people and real events in history, including Ron's about the uh, revolutionary anatomist Andreas Vesalius. Um, so during the event, we're going to have some giveaways and prizes. Uh, we are going to do two rounds of trivia. Now, the first round of video is based on Jan Vandenbosch's journey throughout the novel, and Ron's prepared some questions uh, about the book, about things that happen in the book. We're not going to give away anything that happens. There are no spoilers. Um, but for those of you who have read the book, you'll have a little a leg up on it. So when it's time to do that, I'm going to post a link in the chat so that everyone can participate. And I'll be able to see the results as soon as those are submitted. And uh, the winner, the person with the most points uh, on the quiz, on the trivia, will receive a free history through fiction quote. One of these uh, nice little quote bags that you can use for groceries or carrying books or anything else that you need. Then we're going to do a second round of trivia, and that's going to be true and true false about the author Ron Blumenfeld and also about the press history through fiction. Again, the winner of the trivia will receive a free 50 fiction quote bag. Now, someone's telling me to stay a little close to the mic, so I apologize if, if you couldn't quite hear me well enough there. Uh, after the trivia, we will do a Q&A with the author, and I will use the questions that are in the Ask the Question feature there. If um, you'd like to appear on screen, I will ask you first if you'd like to appear on screen, then I can invite people on screen um, to ask Ron their question and be a part of the event. If you don't want to appear on screen, that's fine. I'll just I'll ask you and you can let us know in the chat and then I will read your question for you. Um, after about 15 minutes of q and I will do a raffle for a free History Through Fiction book box. Um, that includes one of each of our titles. Also includes a tote bag, a bookmark, and a signed book plate from our author, F.M. Dean Yad. And that raffle is open to every attendee. You just have to be present to win. So if you're here uh, and you get picked randomly, then you win that book box. Um, then we'll close the event, uh, but we'll keep it open for anyone else who wants to stay and ask more questions. Um, so we'll kind of informally close the event at, after the raffle, but we'll, we'll, Ron will stay on, I'll stay on, and uh, anyone else that wants to stay and ask if you have a question, uh, you can do that. So let me just read a brief bio of our author tonight, our special guest, Ron Blumenfeld. Ron Blumenfeld is a retired pediatrician and healthcare executive. Ron grew up in the Bronx, New York, and studied at City College of New York before receiving his MD degree from the State University of New York. After completing his pediatric residency at the University of Arizona, he and his family settled in Connecticut, but Tucson remains his second home. Upon retirement, he became a columnist for his town's newspaper, a pleasure he surrendered to concentrate on his debut novel, The Kings of Animals. 
He enjoys a variety of outdoor sports and addictions. He and his wife, Alina, currently reside in Connecticut and are fortunate to have their son, Daniel, and grand granddaughter, Grayson, near Bond. And hopefully you were taking notes because some of that will be on the second round of video. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Ron on screen if you just bear with me here for a second. So I, I've invited Ron on screen, screen. He should be appearing here momentarily. Hi, Ron. Hey, Colin, hey, how are you? I'm fantastic. Congratulations. I, I didn't tell uh, the others, but uh, if you haven't checked um, The Kings and Animist on Amazon today, it is ranking number one in the Renaissance historical yeah. fiction category. So big round of applause. Congratulations, Ron. That's great news. It's trending. It's number one on Amazon right now. Colin, are you able to hear me well? I am, yeah. Good. I'm, okay, great. Uh, anyway, thanks a lot, Colin. Is it is it now my turn to talk, Colin? Yeah, go for it. Great. Well, I'm just so honored and so thrilled to be here tonight with all of you. I can't believe how many of you there are who uh, took took the time to come out uh, to join us for the celebration of the official launch of the King's Anatomist. Uh, this is a hugely important evening for me after this long gestation that really goes back six years. And here we are finally when my book, which was just an idea, six or seven years ago is actually something that's real. So it's just an amazing night for me. Even though I'm alone in my office here, this is such a momentous evening that I brushed my teeth, I shaved again, and I'm actually wearing outside pants. I just wanted to be sure that this was done with the proper uh, setting and nobility that this evening deserves. This is just, just an amazing evening uh, for me. And though we're here to celebrate the book and the launch of the book, I'm also here to celebrate the incredible team that formed behind me through the gestation of the book that helped me to, to cross the finish line. I wanna talk first about my uh, uh, writer's group people who are, who are right here in town, who listen to excerpt after excerpt over the years and gave me the kinds of feedback like, do you really need that comma right here? All the way up to, I don't get it. Uh, so I have to thank them immensely for sticking with me over, over those years. Then come the beta readers. After I had a manuscript that I thought was pretty ready for the outside world, I asked a team of people to take a look at the manuscript. And from them, I got unvarnished, honest feedback that really made my book better. Some of them are, are here tonight with us. And I really want to thank them for all the work that they did. Certainly, I need to thank Colin Mustful, the gentleman to my are you at my right or my left? I can't figure this out. I'm on you're your right. My, okay, you're on my right. Good. Uh, Colin, after a long journey of trying to find somebody to be interested in the book, was the one who saw value in my manuscript and took the risk of publishing it. But not before he took his editorial shots at the book as well. And Colin's work with me and the book uh, definitely made this book what it is today in its final form. Uh, I also have to thank my wife, Celina. Uh, she was the first person to see my raw output and was the first person to um, give me feedback on the book. But the other thing that she did was to let Andreas and Jan move into our house for five years 
and uh, take up a lot of space, make a lot of noise, and be extremely disruptive. Yet she was able to put up with it, and I think in the end she got to like them quite a bit, which is just great. And finally, I'd like to thank Andreas Vesalius for being such an interesting guy and who was really um, an inspiration to me. Uh, before I stop, October 12th happens to be the birthdays of two very dear friends of mine. One is Eddie Kagan, who I met in the summer of 1964 at summer camp and has been a dear friend ever since. Happy birthday, Ed. And my medical school classmate and roommate, Dennis Gort. Uh, I'm not sure if Dennis is on the line, but that's Dennis for you. At any rate, I'll say happy birthday to him too. And I believe it's someone's anniversary tonight. Someone mentioned to me that. And if they'll type in the chat room, if, if you're here, I'll wish happy um, uh, anniversary to you too. At any rate, um, thank you very much. And I guess it's time to get to the trivia. All right. Well, well said, Ron. And yeah, just congratulations. And and you're absolutely right that 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 thanks goes out to so many different people through years and years of hard work and kind of uncertainty. And yeah, it's you should be really proud of, of where you're at now today. I want to do one more thing. Sure. And I wanted to toast all those people. Of course, I do have a festive glass of wine here, and I hope a lot of you out there do too. So I'm going to take a sip to all those people I mentioned right. in great thing. <laughs> all right. There. Okay, I posted a link to a Google form. So everyone who wants to participate, I guess you're not required to, everyone who wants to participate, click on that link. It's going to ask for your name and email address just so we can keep track of the winner. And uh, I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see the questions so that even if you're not participating, you can see those questions. Uh, while we're waiting for everyone to uh, do that, Ron, why don't you tell them about your event on Saturday? Okay, well, uh, for those of you within 500 miles of Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, on Saturday uh, from 12 noon to 3 p.m., I'm going to be doing a sidewalk author meet and greet in front of the Fairfield University bookstore on the Post Road in downtown Fairfield. So uh, come on down and say hello if you're around. And uh, that's your chance to buy a book if you haven't gotten one already. And if you do, I will sign it right then and there. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of you down there. And I wanna say about the uh, trivia, um, even if you haven't read the book, I think you can play and you can take a shot at it. It's not that hard. So I'd urge everyone to sign on. Well, yeah, you put in a, a few kind of silly answers. So a lot of times it's a 50-50. <laughs> That's true. Okay, well, hopefully people have had a chance to click on the link and enter their email address and name. So this first round of trivia is related to Jan's journey from Brussels to Zante. Um, so throughout the, the novel, he travels from Brussels in the Netherlands. Is that right, Ron? Well, it's not called the Netherlands now. Then it was called the Low Countries. Okay, the Low Countries. Travels and it was through Belgium France. now anyway. Now, now it would be uh, Belgium. Um, but yeah, he makes many stops along the way. and. Um, that gives uh, Jan a chance to share some memories of his life with Andreas, his best friend. Jan, of course, is a fictional character and he travels all the way to uh, Venice and then through, what is that, the Adriatic Sea to uh, Zante, right. which Ron, you've been to, correct? I did visit, uh, well, now it's called Zakynthos. It changed its uh -huh. name at some point, I think in the 19th century. But yes, I was there in uh, 2014 by really sheer luck, there was a symposium about Andreas Vesalius uh, on that island where he died. And uh, uh, 2014 was chosen because it's the 500th anniversary of his birth. 
Well, I envy you. It looks like a beautiful place. It was. It is. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll read the first question here. Um, so his journey started in Brussels. What unusual skill did Andreas's friend Jan reveal to Brother Carol, their first schoolmaster? He could touch his nose with the tip of his tongue. He had a photographic memory, or he was ambidextrous. So I'll give everyone a moment to think about that. Okay, another one from Brussels. What secret pastime did young Andreas have in the basement of his house? Model ships, CrossFit training, or animal dissection? Next stop on Jan's journey, Louvain. I'm. How do you pronounce that, Ron? You would say Leuven. Leuven. Yeah. What, what risky plan did Andreas convince Jan to be a part of? Stealing a corpse from a gallows, becoming pirates, or getting Jan to take a math exam in his place? Now moving on to Paris. What does one of Andreas's former medical school professors tell Jan? That Andreas could be an arrogant little snot? That Andreas was a brazen revolutionary? That he plans to give a lecture vindicating Andreas's work? Or all of the above? Staying in France, uh, the next stop was Ornans. Is that how you pronounce it, Ron? No S, Orna. Orna? Yeah, Orna, right. You don't say the S. Okay. I'm not French. Uh, what scene greets Jan and Marcus as they approach the gates of Orna? Well said. The Ornan annual scavenger hunt, the aftermath of a battle, or an interfaith wedding ceremony? And I see there's a typo. That's all right. Interestingly enough, Ron, this is what I do for my day job because I, I read tests aloud to students in K-12. <laughs> all right. Now oh, we're in you know what? We should, we should tell people not to put the answers in the chat. Oh, I, I didn't realize people were doing that. Yep, just... Just do your best to answer um, on the form. And uh, then once I've, I'm done reading all the questions, uh, Ron's going to go over the answers. Uh, once Ron does that, I will reveal who the winner was. But you'll hit submit after all the questions are read. And then Ron will go over the answers. Ba uh, OK, Basel, Switzerland, is that it, Ron? Basel, yep. OK, Basel, Switzerland. Johannes Opornis. The publisher of Andreas's famous textbook, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, surprises Jan by telling him what? Andreas secretly included Jan's likeness on the title page. A Cliff Notes study guide was due out in a few weeks. His typesetters found Andreas to be a pleasure to work with. You know what? It, it looks like in the chat, some people haven't found the link to the form. Okay. Um... It, sh it should be posted there in the chat. I can post it again. Okay, we, we should give people then a couple sure. minutes to catch up. So if you'd still like to participate, we'll just take a quick second. Oops, did I post the right one? Yeah. So Ron, well, we're uh, well. People are catching up on their answers. Can you tell us who Marcus was? Ah, Marcus was. Uh, now, first, I'll back up and say Jan is uh, Andreas Vesalius's fictional 
lifelong friend. He's a um, pretty smart guy. He's like a mathematician. Well, he is a mathematician, but he works uh, pretty much on his own. Marcus is his uh, assistant, housekeeper, bookkeeper, and really friend. And when Jan uh, decides to go to Zante across the continent to visit Andreas's grave, Marcus goes with him, which is a good thing. Because at this point, um, Jan is uh, about uh, 50 years old, 49 or 50 years old. So in, in those days, that was fairly old. He was, he was in very good health, except for a lot of different aches and pains. But still, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uh, arduous trip and a long trip. So having someone around with him was very, very helpful and probably essential. And that was one of my favorite parts uh, was just hearing Jan's um, grievances as, as an elderly man, that, you know, at the time. Uh, even though today you wouldn't be considered all that old. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, Legnano, Italy. At dinner with Jan and Marcus, the young Florentine poet Alfredo Contini describes the plague outbreak in Verona, blames the Jews for the plague, Ooh. or says that he thought the pictures in the Fabrica were gross. Okay, on to Padua, Italy, where Andreas was a university professor. While alone in Andreas's former classroom, Jan is visited by an apparition of Andreas who does what? Silently listens as Jan professes his love for Anne, Andreas's widow, recommends a trattoria around the corner, tells Jan he looks really tired. Okay, finally on his, at his destination of Zante, Greece. What happens at the end of a month long sea voyage from Venice to the island of Zante? Jan is undefeated at shuffleboard. Captain Leon bids Jan and Marcus a tearful goodbye. Once ashore, Jan and Marcus find the church where Andreas is buried. Okay. Well, Ron, um, why don't you, I think everyone's had a chance then to submit those, just hit the submit button at the bottom of your trivia. And I'm gonna look through the responses. And Ron, why don't you go through the answers? Uh, can I see the uh, questions again? Yeah. Um, can you pull them, pull them up separately? Uh, I probably can. Let me um, let me do that. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, so the, so the first question was, what unusual skill did Andreas's friend Jan reveal to brother Carl, the first schoolmaster? And uh, while he might have been able to touch his nose with the tip of his tongue, and he might have been ambidextrous, he did have a photographic memory. So that would be the correct answer. Uh, for the second question, Young Andreas had a secret pastime in the basement of his house. Uh, the right answer should clearly have been animal dissection, since that's what he uh, became as a grown-up. He uh, he started doing that as a as a kid. He, this is something he uh, 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 wrote about um, when he was a uh, when he was a child. That is that he he wrote about doing that as a child, so uh, that would be the right answer. In Leuven, uh, Andreas convinced Jan to help steal a corpse from a gallows. He, they were not interested in becoming pirates, 
And although uh, Andreas would have liked Jan to take a math exam in his place, that didn't happen. So on to Paris, when Jan pays a visit to one of Andreas's former medical school professors, who is called Gwinter of Andernach. And uh, he told Jan that Andreas could be an arrogant little snot, that he was a brazen revolutionary, and that he was planning to give a lecture vindicating Andreas's work, all of which are true. So the correct answer would be all of the above. So from Paris, Jan and Marcus traveled to Ornan, France, where, they're, where uh, Jan's good friend, Cardinal Antoine de Granville, lives. And as they come over a hill and they, uh, to see the gates of the town, they saw something else. Uh, they did not see a scavenger hunt. Uh, I don't think scavenger hunts came around <laughs> quite at that time. Uh, they did not see an interfaith wedding. That's almost certainly not going to happen at that point in time because, as you may recall, this was the time of um, Martin Luther and the Reformation, and there was a lot of uh, interdenominational violence and fighting going on. So an interfaith wedding, even uh, uh, Christian on Christian, would have been highly unlikely. So the, the right answer was that they saw the uh, aftermath of a battle that took place just the, just the day uh, before, and they saw a bunch of, um, bunch of corpses spread out on the field there. It was kind of a horrifying scene to them because it was totally unexpected. From Ornan, they went on to Basel, uh, Switzerland, and I'm, I'm told that they say Baal, in Switzerland, but I'm sticking with Basel. Sounds right. Uh, Johannes Operinus was the guy who published Andreas's famous textbook. And uh, when Jan meets him again after many, many years, um, he gets uh, surprised by hearing that, um, not that there's a Cliff's Notes uh, coming out, uh, not that his typeset has found Andreas a pleasure to work with. In fact, it was quite the opposite. He he stuck around there as they as they got the book ready for months, and he drove everyone crazy because he was a total uh, perfectionist and really drove everyone nuts. But you can tell from the from the book that it paid off. But what Andreas did was to secretly include Jan's likeness on the title page, and. Um, uh, Johannes opened the book and pointed that out to Jan. He had never seen that before, so it was kind of a surprise to him and kind of touching. So um, from Basel, um, Jan and Marcus go over the Alps, which I might add was extremely difficult to do in those days and dangerous, but they made it down into Italy, and uh, they were going to uh, Verona, but they were detoured away from Verona. Uh, and this is why. So they had dinner in um, uh, Lenago with a young Florentine poet, Alfredo Cantini, who, um, oh, now, okay, I'm, I'm looking at an old version. He uh, describes the plague outbreak, uh, which is true. That's, that's the, that's the answer. Uh, he does not blame the Jews for the plague because he himself is Jewish. And uh, when he saw a copy of the Fabrica, he was uh, tremendously impressed by what he said. Even though he's a poet, uh, he thought he would, he would hate seeing it, but it was rather, uh, rather a moving uh, thing for him to see that book. In uh, Padua, Italy, Andreas visits, uh, let's say Jan goes to Andreas's uh, former classroom. And as the classroom darkens, he's alone in the classroom, there seems to be an apparition in the back of the room. And uh, the right answer here 
pretty clearly is that he that the um, the uh, um, apparition silently listens as Jan professes his love for Anne, Andreas's widow, who is now available and who he's had a crush on for about 20 years. So finally, they, they get to Zante after a long and arduous uh, sea voyage. And um, Jan might have been very good at shuffleboard, but he did not play on this voyage. Uh, Captain Leone actually hated Jan and Marcus and was awful to them through the whole time. So he was not at all sad to see them go. And uh, once they got ashore, they, they found the church where uh, Andreas was buried. So that would be the right answer. All right. Thanks. So thank you, everyone, for uh, playing. We had one person with a perfect score, actually a team of people. Uh, it was Philip Rubin and Joette Katz. Um, <laughs> uh, do you know them, Ron? I, uh, I have to admit that I do. Well, congratulations. They got they a perfect Fairfield score. Fairfield neighbors. Um, Way to go. together and got everyone right. So, uh, Philip and Joette, I will send you a free History 2 Fiction tote bag that you can carry the King's Anatomist uh, with with you. I've got your email address, uh, so I'll connect with you to uh, get your mailing address. Okay, let's move on to the second trivia. This one will be a little bit quicker for us here. So I'm just posting that link in the chat now. So go ahead and log on to that, put in your name and email address. This is true and false about Ron and about history through fiction. Mary says, really wonderful book, loved it with four exclamation points. <clears throat> For all of you that did love the book, please um, feel free to let your friends know. Uh, please feel free to shout it out on social media. Uh, let people know about this book let people know about our press. Um, it uh, will really help us out a lot. I'll put reviews up online if you're able to do that. Uh, Goodreads, Amazon, uh, bookshop.org. Philip says Joette did not help. Uh, you know what? That's, that's a very honest type of admission because Joette Katz was a beta reader. So oh. she excused herself as any good lawyer would do. All right, I'm going to post the um, the link one more time, and then I'll start reading here. And it looks like some people have already submitted responses, so they didn't waste any time. Um, also, one last reminder, um, we'll get to the Q&A after this, so please post your questions in the Ask a Question feature there on the bottom. Okay, true, false about Ron Blumenfeld and publisher history through fiction. We uh, think we may have a tie, some ties on this one, but we'll do a tiebreaker <laughs> if that's the case. So the first question is, Ron was an all-star catcher in the stadium Little League in the Bronx. Next question. Ron was the valedictorian of his high school class. Next one is about the publisher. History Through Fiction was founded in 2017. You'd have to know Ron really well to get this one to know the answer to this one. Ron got a perfect score on his first calculus test. The 
If you're paying attention at the beginning, you'll know this one. Ron was a columnist for his local newspaper. History Through Fiction is on Pinterest. What do you think? You've probably seen this on Facebook, but are we on Pinterest? Ron is a retired orthopedic surgeon. History Through Fiction has four titles in its catalog. Ron considers Phoenix, Arizona his second home. And finally, History Through Fiction is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, Ron, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can look at the results. There ought to be several perfect scores on this one. How could my name be counted as a wrong answer? Um, Mary has a comment there. Uh, well, Ron, why don't you go over the answers then? Is there any way you can put them up? Because I, I don't know if I have those easily. Well, maybe I can find them. Hang on a minute. Well, you can click on the form there in the uh, chat. Oh. oh, yeah, that's a good way of doing it. And you can also, I believe you can also share your screen, but I'm not positive on that. Well, as long as you can hear me, okay, then I'm okay. Now, can you actually see me now? Yeah, I can see you. Oh, okay. Anyway, I, I was just curious because now I've just opened up the, the link. All right. So um, was I an all-star catcher in the state of the Middle League in the Bronx? I certainly was. And uh, that was probably where my baseball career peaked and ended. But uh, that was one of my earliest achievements and memorable. I'll never forget those great days. And I know my brother, Bert, who is on the line too, who will also remember them. Uh, okay. Ron was the valedictorian of his high school class. De <laughs> Definitely not. I wasn't at the bottom of my class, but I was somewhere in the middle. I didn't come close to being valedictorian. I had no chance in the high school where I went to. Uh, okay. History Through Fiction was founded in 2017. This is false. Am I right, Colin? Yeah, you're right. 2019. Yeah. 2019. So this is a brand new outfit that we're talking about here. Uh, okay. Ron got a perfect score on his first calculus test. No, in fact, I got a 10 on my first uh, calculus test in college. That's 10 out of 100 by the way, and uh, that was pretty humiliating. And the uh, teacher um, asked me where I went to high school. And it was pretty embarrassing for me to answer that I went to the Bronx High School of Science, but it was true. So she recommended that I drop the course and take college algebra, which I did. And I did really well in college algebra, but Never really caught on to calculus, although I never failed it anymore, but I just wasn't that good at it. So I'm kind of jealous of Jan, who is really a lot better mathematician than I am. Maybe that's why I, maybe that's why I made him a mathematician. Um, after I retired, I did become a columnist for the Fairfield Citizen News. And I did that for about five years. I wrote a whole bunch of columns on the town of Fairfield, its history, its open spaces, and some other topics as well. But that's but when I was uh, deep into the book, I really had to stop writing the columns to focus on the book, which I really didn't want to do because I enjoy doing those columns a lot, but maybe I'll get back to them someday if they'll have me. History Through Fiction is on Pinterest. I believe that's true. Yes. Okay. So those of you who do Pinterest, you can actually find us there, History Through Fiction. Uh, I am not a retired orthopedic surgeon. 
I would hope that a lot of you know that I was a pediatrician. Um, probably would have been a pretty good orthopedic surgeon, but it's, it's not how the dice rolled. Okay, History for Fiction has four titles in its catalog. I know that's true. Yep, yep, that's true. Ron considers Phoenix, and this, this is a trick question, at least for some. Ron considers Phoenix, Arizona, his second home. Actually, it would be Tucson, Arizona. Um, we went out to Tucson in the 70s. That's where I did my, uh, my uh, pediatrics uh, training at the University of Arizona. And I practiced there for uh, two years. And my brother, Bert, lives there along with his wife, Kim, and her two daughters, Brandy and Cassandra, and a granddaughter, Kiana. I want to mention them all. I still have a bunch of friends out in Tucson. I know some of them are online now, and I want to say hi to them. So it's Tucson. The uh, final question, the history through fiction is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I don't know. Is that a trick question, Colin? No, no, it's true. I mean, that's what it's meant to be. It's true. Yeah. Okay. Because your address is Roseville. Yeah. My exact address is Roseville. I say it's but, based in Minneapolis. So okay, I guess if you, wanna, if you want to, if you want to argue for those points, I'm getting <laughs> finicky here. Well, we'll call it true. Okay. Well, we didn't have any perfect scores like we anticipated. Ah. And uh, the winner is Bert. Uh, <laughs> Bert? No, he's he's excluded. Um, well, well, actually, no, it isn't fair because there were some non-Ron questions. Yeah. So, okay. All and right, you, Bert. You're you in. didn't get a perfect score. So right. congratulations to Bert. And I know now what Mary was saying, hey, when you put your name in, it says it's wrong, wrong, because it doesn't know what everyone's name is. Okay, so congratulations to Bert and to Philip. Um, I will be sending you that, that tote bag. Um, so we're going to do a little Q&A now. Um, I see we're already at 42 minutes here. So we're going to do about 10, maybe 12 minutes of Q&A. Uh, then I'll do a raffle for... Um, winner of our book box and we may have to do draw a couple names because there are 78 people registered and 48 here right now you have to be present to win so we might have to do a couple drawings so stick around for that and then uh, we'll stay on then for a few minutes after that for anyone else who wants to ask more questions um, so once again I'm going to invite you on screen if you'd like to ask your question so get those questions posted um, in the ask a question feature there on the bottom. First question comes from Belinda. So I'm just going to ask, um, and I'll wait for a response. Belinda, would you like to appear on screen with Ron? And if you would, just uh, say yes in the chat or I want to say, say no. I want to say also there are some very funny comments in the uh, chat room. <laughs> They're all making me laugh. Good. I haven't had a chance to look through them all. Belinda, are you there? And would you like to appear on screen? Just want to give you a chance to do that. Okay, well, we'll move ahead with her question then. She asks, what started your interest? So what, what got you interested in Andreas Vesalius and, uh, and what got you to write this novel? Well, this is, this is a story that some of you know, and I'll make it short, but basically, uh, in 1964, when I was a high school senior, um, the people who owned the rare bookstore where my mother worked, when when they learned that I was interested in a career in medicine, uh, wanted me to know about Andreas Vesalius. So they gave me a biography of him that just came out. I took it home and I started to read it. And I bailed on the book after... 20 pages, I've got it on the shelf right here. Oh, hang on. I just have to show it because I want to also honor the uh, people who own the bookstore. This, this is the book that has been on my shelf for 50 years. Anyway, and the, the uh, name of the bookstore is Philip C. Dushness Rare Books and First Editions where my mother worked as a temp and stayed there for 40 years. 
But anyway, um, they gave me the book. <clears throat> I started to read it as a high school student, and it was way over my head. It was much too academic for me. So I put it on my shelf where it sat for 50 years. When I retired, I spotted it on the bookshelf. I took it off the shelf to give it another try, and I found that I was ready to read it. And that's how I learned about Andreas Vesalius, and it was the inspiration for the book. <clears throat> Thanks, Belinda. Okay, yeah, thank you, Belinda. Our next question comes from Paul, and I have a little button here that says invite user on screen. So I'm just gonna invite him on screen and he can um, say no thanks if he wants. So we'll wait a minute here to see if Paul comes on screen. <clears throat> if not, I will read the question. Victoria says, you look like your dad. Ha. Huh. That's probably true. Everyone everyone starts starts looking like their parents at some point. All right. No thanks if he wants. Okay. So, uh Paul asks, <clears throat> when you began writing the book, did you know how it was going to end or did it evolve during the writing? An excellent question because there is a a twist there. It is a mystery and it's written quite convincingly. So, Ron, um, did you know how it was going to end, or did it just kind of come to you? Interestingly, <clears throat> I knew in general terms how it would end, but what was even harder for me was where I was going to start the book. So I, I had the whole plot pretty much laid out in my own mind and an outline form, uh, but... Uh, I, I, I wasn't really sure about the order of things. So that, that took place after I started writing and I found that I could move a, a block of writing from one point uh, to another to get the order right. Uh, the, the, the book starts with the death of Andreas Vesalius or the, the um, news of his death. And I wasn't sure when that was going to be uh, introduced. And I don't want to talk about the ending because that would be a spoiler. So um, I sort of knew, but not exactly where it would come out. But it, 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 it started to make sense to me as I, as I got into the writing of the book. Thanks, Paul. Okay. I, I've got a couple questions in there, but I see that we've got a new question from Brandy. So Brandy, I'll invite you on screen. Uh, you're welcome to reject that invitation if you don't want to appear on screen, but we'll give you a second here to decide if you want to appear on screen to ask Ron your question. Oh, and it appears the question is actually from Josh, but it's written by Brandy. <laughs> Hello. This is this is family from Tucson. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see if you still claim that after my question. <laughs> <laughs> so joining this a little bit late. I'm not exactly sure how old you are. Did you get to meet this guy in person? <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> next time I see you, I'm in trouble. You know, I'll, I'll say they this. let anyone into this thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, and it's it's kind of a, a, a kind of a metaphoric answer, but I think it works. I had lived with him so long and so intimately that I really do think that I was his contemporary. Right. Yes, on. I have met him. Great yeah. answer. How's that? Right on. <laughs> okay. I was getting worried about you where you were going if Solana <laughs> had to worry about anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to see you guys. Yeah, yeah congratulations, Ron. Ditto. Thanks. Congrats. Well, that was rude. <laughs> oh, I would, I would, I would expect nothing else from my family. All right. Uh, so uh, I've got just a. Um, I'll ask a question of you here. I'm curious. Was writing fiction challenging for you? What was it like to learn how to do that, and, and how challenging was it? You know, it's interesting that you use the word challenging because I really took this project on really as a personal challenge. 
I had never written any long form uh, fiction and most everything I've written, whether it was in the business world or as a columnist or whatever, it was certainly nonfiction or um, expository. But um, uh, during my uh, adult years, I took a few stabs at short stories. They were uh, uniformly terrible, but I think they could have gotten better if I'd worked on them some more. I just didn't. But I, it was, um, I, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say that it was challenging in the sense that I didn't know where I was going. I, I just find writing as really a, a long problem solving process. So I, I was very uh, patient with myself. I had read a couple of books on writing, which I think helped me think about things. Um, but I'm un, untrained really in that sense. So I, I, I just sort of let myself gradually let the book take shape. Uh, at first, I was scared of dialogue, actually. Uh, I, I wasn't sure that I could write dialogue well, but I really uh, soon came to see that dialogue was uh, essential, really, for me in the book. And I just let it go. And, and all of a sudden, I found that I was pretty comfortable with it. Yeah, it's um, you. You, it's 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 a part of the craft is is writing dialogue. But you you realize if you just listen to people and listen to, to conversations, and it, right. it can come naturally. Right. So, last question I'll ask here before we do our raffle is: uh, Are you working on a new novel? Ooh, um, I have a a couple of ideas about it. Um, one might be sort of a sequel to this one because the the book is left with several open-ended things so um that's a possibility there's also a, um other um areas of interest that some interesting things that happened in europe a couple of centuries earlier that i found kind of interesting and i'm thinking about that as well um I might at some point want to try writing something contemporary, but I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. I think I have some unfinished business in the historical fiction genre. So I'll kind of leave it at that. It's kind of vague, but that's that's where I am right well, now. Several, several reviewers have said we can't wait to see your next, next novel. So hopefully you get working on that. Well, that's encouraging. Uh, we've got a couple more questions here. I think I'll wait to ask those um, until after our I uh, find out the winner of our raffle. Um, so uh, we'll see who's listening. I'm going to ask if Eileen would pick a number between 1 and 78. Eileen, uh, someone I met on Facebook, she runs uh, a Facebook group called Pros and the Pandemic. Um, it's a wonderful group for writers, so any writers out there might be interested in joining that group. So Eileen... If you're listening, uh, type in the chat a number between 1 and 78. And let's try someone else. Do you know John Harper? Uh, John Harper. Can you pick a number between 1 and 78? Type that in the chat. Come on, John. They've fallen asleep on us, Ron. <laughs> I don't get it. That's okay. Uh, well, Ron, why don't you pick a number between 1 and 78? I will pick a number between 1 and 78, and I will say 59. 59 is Randy Hutt. Randy Hutt, Whoa. are you here? Randy Hutt is a high school classmate. Is he John Harper's answer? Oh, John Harper. Oh, John Harper one. finally answered. Uh oh, Randy. Thank you, John. Uh, is Randy Hutt here? Okay, yes, he is. 
Okay, congratulations, Randy. You have won the sheet. raffle, which include one uh, of each our each of our books, which I've got here. So of course you'll get the King's Anatomist if you already have it. You can gift that to someone. You'll get the Education of Delome uh, from Nancy Burkhalter. You don't need to do anything. I will email you and um, get your um, mailing address. We have the Sky Worshippers by. Uh, FMD Miad, and that will come with a signed book plate by the author. And then we've got my novel, Resisting Removal, and that will also come signed. So you'll get each one of those. You'll also get a bookmark, and you'll get the tote bag. Um, so I will send Sam, that I don't even you. have a tote bag. Well, well, you'll get one. Uh, so actually, I'm coming to... Uh, Hartford, uh, in two weeks, a week and a half, um, I'll be at the Connecticut uh, Literary Festival with Ron in Hartford, Connecticut, and that'll be on Saturday, the 23rd. Randy, Randy Hutt is willing to come on, and she wants to point out that, that she is a female. Okay. Anyway. Oh, did I say he? Yeah, you did, but that's understandable, I guess. Well, any hey, last Randy. Um, so I want, I just want to thank everyone for coming to this event. I want to thank you so much for supporting Ron, for supporting the press. Um, like I said, please go on and share, share, uh, about the book on social media, let your friends know. Um, uh, but we really appreciate it. We hope you had an enjoyable evening here in this virtual event. Um, and if you want to stay on, we can, uh, do some more Q and A with Ron. Uh, but Ron, I'll let you say uh, your thanks here. Well, I'll just echo uh, what you just heard from Colin. Thanks. I, it's it's so great that so many of you uh, came out uh, to be here for this. This is obviously uh, a chapter of my life that is um, quite remarkable for me. And it's been just great to be able to share it with all of you, all of my family and my friends from all walks of life, from everywhere. Uh, it's just, just amazing uh, to see all of you all. I don't see you, but I know you're there and I can feel your presence and thank you very much for coming out. All right. So th thanks again for joining us. We're going to, Ron and I are going to stay on. So, um, you're welcome to stay. Um, let me look at the next question here. So Ron, we have a question from Bert and Kim Blumenfeld. I know them. I'll them on screen if they're still here. They are, by the way, at this moment in Mexico. So this this is an international party. Really? Are they vacationing there? They um, are. Man, Randy, I'll send you an email. I'll use the email that you use to register for this event. Well, um, Bert and Kim ask, since the body was exhumed, since the body that was exhumed was not Andreas, uh-oh. <laughs> no, no. I don't think we can go for any further. <laughs> well, Jesus. luckily, the people have started. And otherwise, uh, yeah, it might be a spoiler there. Bert, seriously. I, I should have read ahead. I did not read ahead. <laughs> You can't do that. <laughs> and uh, Margaret wants to know, are you really wearing pants? <laughs> I admit I wore, the, uh, you know, a button down there shirt. They are. I, I'm wearing sweatpants myself. No, I, I had to dress up for this. Oh, we have Stephen Goldberg checking in from Canada. So Another Canada and Mexico. Person. Wow. All right. I'm going to read this next question ahead. It comes, uh, I don't know who it comes from. Oh, yes, I do. Terry Quinn. Uh -huh. I'm going to send, send Terry an invitation here. Terry is a Tucson and also. Dale McCall says, nice seeing you in person. Had you communicated with Dale previously? I don't think so. But it's nice okay, to well, see you too, even though I'm not seeing you. 
Well, it is nice when to, you know authors are so available nowadays. You can buy a book and and uh, connect with them just about anywhere. Oh, we have somebody joining us. This oh, must be that's that's Terry, Terry Quinn. Hi, Hi Terry. Ryan. Congratulations. Howdy. Thank you. I, the computer just asked me if I wanted to join you, so I said yes. So here I am. I'm in the party. I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I have a question there, Colin. Yeah. You see it. I don't have it myself. You're going to have to read it. Oh, okay. So the question reads, what was your most interesting discovery while writing the book? And what would you most like your readers to take away from reading your book? Also, I hear there's some steamy stuff. What can you tell us? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. I don't think you'll find the steamy stuff extremely steamy. Actually, though, some of the, well, it's, it's just not, it's. Oh, come on, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's certainly not X-rated. And it's, uh, it's, it's sort of like PG 13 plus steamy. So it's, you know. It's it's like that, but there is there is some steam. We'll say that. At any rate, um, what what was the most interesting uh, discovery? Well, it was really learning about. Well, there were really two. One was what uh, 16th century life was like. I really got a very good look into what it was like to live in the 16th century, especially with everything that, everything that was going on in Europe at the time with. Martin Luther, outbreaks of plague, so on and so forth, and um, and war after war after war that was going on in Europe. They they were constantly at war, constantly. If it wasn't Catholic versus Protestant, it was Duke versus King for for land. They they just loved to fight about land, and that just went on constantly. But in in the the other most interesting thing was about. Uh, Andreas Vesalius himself, and what an amazingly focused prodigy he was. I mean, he he started writing this book at the age of 23 and finished it at the age of 28, wrote it all by himself, oversaw the printing of the book, oversaw all the art that was done. And it, it was just an incredible uh, uh, achievement for someone that even really in those days, they were older than we were now, but still in all, he was very young to have done what he did. It was just an unbelievable achievement. So I think that was that was an interesting thing to learn about him, definitely. Well, there you have it, Terry. Thank you. Great to see you. Say hi to Mark. I will. All right. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, and what um, some people might not know is we kind of um, took a little of the steam out of the story, uh, tried to develop those characters a little bit more. But why didn't Jan and Anne get together? I was hoping it would happen. Happy endings. Uh, so that was that was actually interesting. That was an interesting part of our edits because we had to decide: do should they get together or shouldn't they get together? And um, yeah, so we, we did work through that, didn't we, Ron? We did work through that. And I, I, I think we were generally the, the ending, which we can really leave alone. I think people will have to read the book to get the absolute ending, but, uh, the, the, the way the ending came about, I think served to make, to give Anne much more, uh, agency in the, in the story. And I felt, um, good about making that change. I think it was the right thing to do. What, what do you know about Anna, about Andreas's daughter? Aunt, well, Anne and Andreas's daughter. She, right. she was a real character. She's a real person, correct? She was a real person. She was the daughter of Anne Vesalius and Andreas Vesalius. She uh, stayed in Brussels. She married um, a lawyer and lived uh, quietly in Brussels until 
and she died. Well, let's uh, wait a minute or two here, just a minute to see if anybody else wants to post a question. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll end the broadcast. That was Randy Hunt, correct? That had won Hunt, the round? H-U-T-T. H-U-T-T, okay. So any last minute questions, go ahead and you can just post those right in the chat or the ask a question feature there. Let's see, I'll take a look at the poll here. We've got, uh, have you read the Qu Kings and Adamus? We have 12 votes for yes, nine for not yet. Do you know Ron? 18 yeses and three no's. So of the people who took the poll, um, most of them do know you. I will say you have quite a crowd of um, well-wishers and friends and it's great to know yeah i appreciate very much that everyone came out uh, to share this day this is uh colin why don't you say what's going on in amazon with the book right now our ranking did you already mention that yeah i did i'll show i'll show it here on screen hopefully it's still there um so as you can see, it is a number one new release in Renaissance historical fiction. And that's the, the ebook version. So if I click here on Renaissance historical fiction, oh, there it is, number one. We are number one. That's pretty cool. There it is at number eight too. Oh, that's your paperback is at number eight. And there it is at number 12. <laughs> So that's great, great news. Um, First time I've been nationally be... ranked. Yeah, if you scroll down here on Amazon, you can see these, uh, I guess, haven't caught up. And then it's even number five in medical history. Okay, I see another question here. Oh, I see a couple. Um, will you sign our copy? Um, Jane and Perry, do you know them? I do. Absolutely, if we ever get to see you. And I have Maria uh, asking, how did you develop Jan's character? What made you conjure up this fictional friend? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, that was something that I had to decide at the beginning of the book because everything really flows through Jan. And I was really trying to figure out how best to tell Andreas's story uh, without having Andreas tell it. So uh, I, I just thought it would be a good idea to invent somebody who who knew him better than almost anyone else did in the world and who would have the uh impetus to make the journey all the way to zante and jan um jan really was a very interesting character to work on in and of himself because of 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 his uh birth and his upbringing uh how um uh jan and andreas met what they meant to each other and the friendship they had, which was kind of a give and take type of type of thing. Um, Andreas being the uh, alpha male, but as they got into uh, uh, adulthood, there was much more of an equilibrium with them. Although um, Jan was so uh, devoted to Andreas that he would really do anything at his beck and call. Uh, it was really fun to work on that. And I think Jan was a, an excellent uh, vehicle through which to have Andreas' story told along with the uh, voyage that he took across Europe. So Jan was, Jan almost is a protagonist in this, in this story, really. Um, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to, uh, to learn about him.
and to see him you know grow as I as I wrote it. So thank you for asking about Jan because he's he's kind of near and dear to my heart. Yeah, excellent question, Maria. And I see Nancy Burkhalter, our very own history through fiction author, author of The Education of Delome, uh, Chopin, Sand, and La France, is checking in. She says, Vesalius doesn't seem like a very nice person, rather self-absorbed. Do you like him? You're right that he is self-absorbed, um, but I, I do like him a lot. Uh, just because he was so passionate about his work and so uh, exacting about his work and so uh, courageous about bringing his work forward in an environment where he knew he would not be uh, accepted easily uh, at first. So um, that's that's the part of him that I really liked. And of course, he he is able to show in the book there are, that there are softer sides of him, uh, which uh, you know that's that's just what what he was he was he was like. He's flawed, but um, all in all, I think to me he's a net positive, and I I would have been happy to have been his friend, although he would have been hard to deal with from time to time. I'm sure. Yeah, uh, he's a complicated Thanks, uh, historical figure. John uh, said that the screen is frozen. He just doesn't have any audio either. Um, Dan says closing the site and re-entering worked for someone. Everything's normal here. So hopefully it's working. And, and yeah, maybe if you close out and come back in. I do see another question popped up in the Ask a Questions. This is from... Bert and Kim again. Uh, should we trust them to ask you another question? I don't know. Yeah, let's see what they've got. Why did they? Why did you give Jan the math whiz characteristic? Ah, well, you know, I I wanted Jan to have something that uh, distinguished himself, and um, he it just as a as a as a counterpoint to uh, Andreas, who had his strengths, Jan certainly had his. He had the photographic memory. Uh, he was a he was a mathematics whiz, absolutely. He was a champion chess player. So I I just wanted him to have strengths that at least could come up against those those of Andreas, and and uh, I think those strengths kind of played off very well against. Uh, those of Andreas's. So it, it, it was just a, it was just kind of a, kind of a fun thing, I think, but I, but I think it, it really became uh, important for, for Jan to have those strengths as he, as he went, as we, as we went through the book. Good question. Definitely. Okay. Well, Ron, uh, this was fun. Um, it was. Again, congratulations. I think we'll wrap things up here. Uh, I know it's after nine o'clock there on the East Coast, after eight o'clock here yep. Central. Um, but this was a wonderful event. Um, and I'm so glad that everyone was able to come. Um, I want to point out that my that my son is pointing out that Jan's shuffleboard skills were pretty poor. Yeah. <laughs> Which is true. Uh, so again, Ron will be at Fairfield University Bookstore on Saturday if you have a chance to come out there and meet him. To three. Yeah. Um, I will be in St. Paul on Saturday at the Twin Cities Book uh, Twin Cities Book Festival, and then Ron and I will both be in Hartford on Saturday the twenty third at the Arts Way Center. Do you remember where it's at? I think that's that's the name of it. The uh, Connecticut literary festival yeah this this will be the first time that colin and i will meet in the flesh yeah we've never actually met each other and uh, maria's asking if you'll come to yeah. toronto to toronto the answer to that is i would love to come to toronto because we have very good friends there and sure i'd love to come 
Okay, well, thanks again to everyone uh, for coming. Congratulations, Ron. And uh, thank well, you, everyone, for showing up. I really appreciate it. Adios.